right. Okay, thank you again, Nizam. And thank you for coming. I mean, uh, you guys don't really know. I mean, Nizam is an incredible writer. I can't wait to read uh, his book that he's, write, he's going to write. And if he doesn't know that he's going to write a book now, he knows. <laughs> Uh, and he comes up with, uh, uh, right, so well, in such short notice also. I'm very grateful for you, for that talent of yours. Uh, it's something that is very lacking as far as my arsenals are concerned, right? Uh, so, uh, <laughs> the, uh, I'll give you a little story of how we come up with this topic. It's kind of a funny, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it seemed like uh, the question was, can you talk about Tumo, which is uh, a, a topic that is really uh, a, a considered to be a, a, a tantric topic. By tantric, it means that in order for you to be taught this, you have to be uh, gone through some sort of ceremony where you've sort of uh, pledged secrecy, and then you've pledged to commit your life to certain behaviors. And then you're taught what is within the the what is within the literature of uh, the teachings of tantra, and tumo is one of those things, and it happens to be one of the. Uh, it's not just something that it's not really an introductory level teaching, also, because what 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 uh, tumo is teaching you is basically to uh, to consciously control your energies. That's what Tumo is about, okay? Uh, and people who have mastered this technique have basically, uh, uh, one, one of the signs of having mastered that is that they've basically become automatic uh, temperature regulation in their in the bodies. They basically have their own air conditioner and own heaters within their system. So nothing outside affects them. They can walk in the in the hot desert with a coat on, and it's not going to make them pass out. Or they can walk in the, in the freezing Himalayas with just a pair of uh, swimming uh, trunks on, and they're not going to freeze. So their body is always regulated. So that's one of the signs. But that's not the purpose of it, of course. <laughs> the purpose of that is not to uh, have internal air conditioning. But it's just one of the signs of it. It's it's all geared towards uh, enlightenment in in the end. So uh, I wanted to clarify: Is that what you wanted to talk about? <laughs> because I can't talk about that in in an open sort of a forum. And then he uh, uh, clarified it, and then Nizam put it together in a nicely, beautiful way. Uh, I think the way Nizam put it almost came up came out as. If that's not what he meant, that's what we should talk about. <laughs> uh, okay, so it's about really the heat of the emotions and how do we uh, navigate that? How do we control that kind of heat when we are in, when some emotions are so high that they are, uh, they are about to burn us? How do we control that? How do we self-regulate that? Because Especially nowadays, you can say that, uh, unfortunately, it's not just something that's happening in one, one place. Because of the beauty of uh, social media, the, the, because of the beauty of, uh, I, I'm saying beauty because they give us opportunities where I'm able to communicate with somebody who lives on the other side of the world in real time, right? And someone in real time in the other side of the world can uh, publish something and I can read it in the next moment. So this is an incredibly wonderful thing that we are experiencing. But at the same time, this is also uh, letting us uh, uh, share certain things or we would say sort of develop. Perhaps it's a wonderful thing. It's helping us. Is that a, I'm not sure if this is for you or not. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Sorry, I have to uh, approach it this way so I can read better, but it's not for me. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it's a blessing. And at the same time, it can be, uh, I would say in the beginning of it, we are in the very beginning of 
the the world becoming uh, more of more into a one community kind of thing. And it's a wonderful thing, but at the same time, I guess we have a lot of things that we need to clear out. And one of the things that we are developing in the meantime is extremes, where we feel that there are so many people talking, the only way for us to get uh, attention, to get notice, is to shout and to say things that are that disturbs emotions, that grabs on ex uh, uh, extreme emotions, extreme anger, extreme joy. It has to be one of those things, otherwise uh, we will not be able to pay, we will, we will not be able to get attention paid to them. It's, and uh, uh, interestingly, uh, very recently, I'm not sure where exactly where I got this, but I think it's something to do that came from the Sufis, where the idea of, it's interesting how this observation, when two people are angry with each other, they are shouting. And yet when people are very intimate, they speak very so very and the explanation for that, not that it's the explanation, but a beautiful uh, interpretation of that is that when we are angry, we are actually far from each other. Our souls are our our essence is far from each other. And we need to shout to get a sense that we are so that the other can hear us. It's interesting. And then when we, when our hearts are very close, we don't need to shout. We naturally uh, speak in in a in in a low low tone, like we almost whisper because we are so close. And even to the point where we can even uh, feel each other's thoughts without even the the thought being spoken. Yeah. So it's something like that where we are at the same time growing apart. And because of that, we feel the need to shout at each other so that the other, we so have a sense that the other one is listening to us. So uh, this is where we are. And a lot of us, uh, I'm sure some, there's, there are certain things that are happening in the world, in your life that makes you, that boils you up a little bit, that brings up the heat and you have to navigate. You have to acknowledge that's what's my experience and at the same time not be overwhelmed by it where it uh, basically um, harms you. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to say it again. <laughs> I say all the time. Uh, this will not last long. <laughs> I'll try to end on time, but you never know. <laughs> Okay, so let's begin with a meditation to prepare ourselves. Mm. Bring it to conscious awareness that you're going to meditate. Allow your own body, your own being to connect with what, what is meditation? rather than impose onto your body, onto yourself, what is meditation, let them respond. Oh, you want to meditate? I know what that is. And listen to the body's intelligence. You want to meditate? Okay, arrange yourself this way, your legs, your torso, your arms, your shoulders, your hands, your head and neck, and as you are paying attention and you're making adjustments, you begin to feel that you are touching those places. You are touching, you begin to touch the meditative state with those places. You begin to feel the legs are entering meditative state. There's a sense of calming coming over them. There's a sense of pleasantness coming over them. There's a sense of distinctiveness with the legs. There's a sense of nowness with the legs. along with the other parts of the body, all the way to the head and neck, the eyes. Allow your own in natural intelligence to guide you as to how you should have your eyes. The reason that different meditators, different meditation uh, tr traditions have different guidance as to how you should have your eyes 
is because there's no universal way for you to have your eyes. There is just listen, because what works for you may not work for someone else. What works for someone else may not work for you. So allow your own body to guide you. And as you place your eyes in what works best for you, it should enhance the sense of entering a meditative state, the sense of calming, enhancing, the sense of pleasantness, enhancing, the sense of distinctive knowing, enhancing, the presentness of experience, enhancing, and a sense of attention collecting itself, collecting itself. And when you feel that the body is ready, that you've done as much as you can consciously to attend to the body, then you de deliberately, consciously go to the breath. You simply know you're breathing in as you're breathing in. You simply know you're breathing out as you're breathing out. At first, just pay attention and allow the intelligence within the natural intelligence to guide you. If you need to do something specific with the breath, let that be a guidance coming from within. Sometimes to make the transition from outside to, to more deeper, we may need to do some conscious breathing exercises to help, but it's not absolutely necessary. Just bring attention to the breath. You breathe in, you know you're breathing in. You breathe out, you know you're breathing out. And I find this helpful as you breathe out, you let yourself go. And at the end of that out breath, as you breathe in, you try to stay in the depth that you've reached. So stay as you breathe in. Let go as you breathe out. Feel the new depth, the enhanced calm, the enhanced pleasantness, the enhanced distinctiveness and clarity, the instinctiveness, the enhancement in the collective, collective, aspect of the of attention and you try to stay there as you breathe in you don't try to force it you just have the intention to stay and eventually it seems to be stable but it seems to be stable either you stay at the measure a measure that you've reached you're not coming out of it but also you may notice that enhancement continues it may not be immediate, but you stay and you go deeper and you stay there, you go deeper, you stay, you go there deeper. So that's stability. And now that you've reached some measure of stability, you can now make a definite decision to fully enter into the meditative state. You have this in your mind as kind of a willingness and to sort of bring your entire being into it, you can use the breath as like the signature, the stepping into the final full, full commitment. And I do that with a breath, a nice deep breath, consciously, fully. You hold the breath for a second or two, and then you, as you release. And as you release, you let go, you let go, you let go in the body, you let go in the mind, let go and notice yourself going deeper into the calm, deeper into the pleasantness, deeper into the clarity, the radiance, deeper into the focus, letting go, letting go. And at the end of that exhalation, you try to stay where you've reached as you breathe in. Stay, stay, stay. And notice with just the intention to stay, there's a natural, skillful way of breathing that helps you to stay. And with the next exhalation, you continue allowing yourself to go deeper, letting go. And make the definite affirmation that you are now in some measure in the meditative state. You are now abiding and having access a more subtle, a more powerful level of consciousness. There may be very familiar attributes, very familiar qualities that, it, that are familiar to states outside of meditation, but consider them to be, this is this state, this attribute in the meditative state. This is hearing in a meditative state. 
this is feeling touch in the meditative state. And have a sense of making connection with that part within you that is asking you, that is calling you, that is giving you a sense of there's more, there is more. And once you make connection with there is more, there's a sense, there's a promise of a life that is more, has more meaning that makes life itself meaningful. So connect with that. No need to give it any specific qualities of light or, or whatever. Just feel that gut instinct that is calling you towards something that, that will help you make life more meaningful. And let yourself go to it the same way you're letting go of the breath. And you begin to have some sense of touching something different. It may be very, it may have a very commonness to it, or it may have a very unfamiliar sense to it. It may last a second, it may have last longer than a second, even less than a second, but there's a sense of touching something. Stay with that sense of touching something connected to that which is promising you a life of meaning. And gently raise your attention to the space in front of you at the level of your eyebrows. Keeping that sense of directing, making, wanting to make contact with that sense, with that invitation, the source of that invitation. In whatever way, there is uh, uh, what you might call your own palpable way of having made contact. It could be grand, a sense of being in the presence of blinding light, or it could be a tiny, tiny sense of a presence of something that is not quite clear, but there's a sense of something like an image that is slowly appearing out of the fog, but there is the sense of that image there, even though it may not be completely clear, but there's a sense of it. So just keep relaxing, allowing the fog to clear and accepting that itself as a beautiful achievement, a beautiful way of making contact. And wherever, to whatever, there's a natural sense of reliance, a natural sense of, of something that is worthy of receiving your, your deepest, highest respect. This is it. Turn that sense of the high, deepest respect towards it. It is worthy of it. Turn your sense of complete trust towards it. It is worthy of your complete trust. If there is ever something that you can completely trust, this is it. 
let yourself, that sense of trust go towards its direction and continue to relax, clearing away or allowing it to become brighter, more present. And there is something within us that tells us that it has always been guiding us in those moments when we've completely felt the need that we are at a loss, somehow we came through, but we don't know exactly how. So it was in reliance on this, so you can trust it, you can rely on it, and you can be grateful to it. And there's a promise that is a promise that is stable and indefinitely trustworthy. And let its presence shower you with its brightness, with its its embrace of light. This is your own potential. that you've been sensing, that you've been, that has been calling you towards making it, making yourself into it. So to that deeper part of you that brought you here, let yourself be aligned with it so that whatever that is of benefit to you, you may receive it and be able to put it into immediate application. and to sort of help cement the inseparability of you and this potential and your capacity to have a direct communication with it. Have a sense of that presence, however you feel it, coming to the crown of your head. Feel some sort of physiological sensation at the crown of the head. Ascribe that sensation to its presence and allow yourself to let this presence descend through the crown of your head until it arrives in the very center of your heart and feel your mind fill with it. Feel a sense of direct contact. A measure of confidence that the deep questions you have, the answers are right there in that presence.
Okay, now think of a worthy reason why you're attending this session and allow the compassion reason, the compassionate reason, the loving reason to come in, come to the fore and get ready to come out of the meditation. First, witness yourself actually in the meditative state. Notice the signs in the body, in the breath, in the mind. Welcome them, rejoice in their presence and make a conscious decision to come out of the meditation just like you make the conscious, deliberate decision to go in, make a conscious, deliberate decision to come out. And you can also use the breath, just like you used it to go in. You can use it to come out. A nice deep breath in through the nose. And as you breathe out, uh, you just have to reconnect with your immediate surroundings, deliberately taking in whatever your sense of touch is telling you about your immediate surrounding, your sense of hearing, sense of sight. All right. Uh, what was a very long time ago, uh, the, what you might call the framework to what became these, uh, meetings on, on Zoom, uh, during those times, uh, the meditation used to be a bit more formal. And for those of you who've been coming over time, they be, the, the meditations have, have become less and less formal, less and less formal, more and more open without uh, much uh, uh, allusion to any specific tradition. Uh, so that means you, know, you fill that in with whatever, whatever helps, okay? Uh, and perhaps I might, one of those, uh, one of these sessions, I might, uh, I may uh, bring back one of those uh, format formal ways of meditating, okay? But, when I do, this is the warning, <laughs> when I do bring them, don't, don't consider them to be, uh, don't take them as, uh, what do you call that? Uh, like when, when a doctrine is presented to you and then you're supposed to take it as, this is the only way to do it. Don't take it as that, okay? But see them as, ah, this is how, those essence were a given form for someone or for some people so that they can make deeper contact with, with, with that kind of, with the essence of the meditation, okay? So keep that in mind. So when that comes up. All right, now let's dive into middle path. And for those of you who are familiar with uh, Buddhism, uh, one of the almost synonymous with Buddhism is the middle path. And why is it called the middle path? If you remember the story of, uh, um, of Siddhartha Gautama, who became, who became the Buddha, how he became the Buddha was he had a nagging question, the same nagging question that we all have. And he opened his mind to how he could come to an answer, a resolution. And he approached many different teachers, uh, applied sincerely the method that they were presenting to him. And he was, uh, uh, with his open mind, that means he was allowing his own innate sense, innate um, validator, to tell him whether or not did I find what I was looking for. Of course, other people were telling him, this is what you need to do. And this is the thing that you were looking for. So that just like you know 
uh, may not may not know it consciously, but there's a deep sense within you that sort of you know what you're looking for, and it is that de deep sense of knowing that will let you know you a hey, you found it. You will not need an outside validation. There was something within you that will validate it for you. Okay, and that's why you can say that. Uh, well, a lot of diff different traditions have, you know, to express this, they uh, give us, it, it's already, it's already, the answer is already within you, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, high philosophy to explain whether it is correct or incorrect, but you can, you understand the gist of what they were trying to point to when they say that, whether the answer is within you, it's not within you, that, that, that that's not the point. But it's, it's basically to address that validator within us that is going to tell us, A, you found it. So uh, one path that the Buddha was taking was an extreme, one, one uh, path of extreme. You could say uh, before he left, so that means within, when he was living home, he was, in a sense, in one extreme path, the path of indulgence. And he came out of that, he went to another extreme, and the, the, uh, the extreme of uh, uh, deprivation, where, where I'm not sure exactly if that is truthful or not, but again, it is to convey a meaning. He was eating one grain of rice per day basically starving himself because he was presented with a path or oh, the answer you're looking for if you starve basically if you starve yourself eventually you will get to the answer but what he arrived at in each of the extremes had nothing to do with uh the answer that he was looking for so he abandoned those and then he uh, and he uh began to do something where he wasn't indulging himself too much nor was he depriving himself too much so he was in the middle okay so that's that's how that's how that's why the buddhist path is referred to as the the, the middle path uh now it's not simply the middle path because are you trying to live a life of high luxury or are you trying to live a life of high uh, deprivation that is not necessarily the the middle path that is that that is the middle path itself so you could say it's all middle and there are even some who might even <laughs> who, who may even have taken middle to an extreme middle to an extreme meaning well uh maybe you can steal a little bit <laughs> not to steal at all is sort of a, a, an extreme. We have to go to the middle path. You have to steal a little bit. Uh, maybe you can kill a little bit. <laughs> you know, that's a, like uh, taking mi the middle path to an extreme itself. Okay. Now uh, we are not living in uh, perhaps your life right now is not living in in, in uh, where you have the choice between extreme this or extreme that as far as the the what the classical presentation of the middle path is but we are we do live in uh like i said before especially now um uh people who are trying to get our attention uh pushing buttons that makes us uh, the way to grab our attention is to make us very angry or they are promising us bliss some kind of a great great thing take this medication even though it may kill you, <laughs> it will cure everything. <laughs> but it might kill you in the process. <laughs> uh, come to this place. Uh, uh, all your dreams will be fulfilled there. Okay. So it, it's, no one is presenting anything in the middle path because it, it, the middle path seems to be boring. We have become so accustomed to uh, being lured towards uh, one way or another either extreme anger, extreme jealousy, or extreme passion, that we are almost becoming, uh, we think that 
anything other than that is is not real almost. But being dragged to either one of those extremes is very unhealthy for us, psychologically unhealthy, also physically unhealthy for us, where, where, where our emotions are basically being you no know, stretched as far as they can uh, be stretched and then let go of and snap in the middle. Okay. That's what's happening to our emotional body. But when uh, we are being presented with, uh, uh, with things, that that are pulling on our extreme emotions they are pulling our extreme emotions when we hear oh did you hear what what your enemy is has done and then you go you you become very angry there are the uh then this place is promising you uh this is the where the, the highest happiness can be found and you're moved towards that to i think also to the point where uh, and it's it's kind of a silly thing, where uh, and it also shows a gross misunderstanding what those two terms are actually referring to, where people are uh, either it's either it either has to be heaven or hell, and we don't want anything in the middle, and some people are even seeing he uh, heaven as well. Eventually, it's gonna get boring because it's not gonna have any. Uh, uh, any excitement, but hell is always ex is always exciting. Okay, I mean this is absolutely silly. This is coming from people who have no understanding what those terms are supposed to be referring to. Okay, uh, and and this kind of thing also make us behave towards one another in a way that is harmful towards each other. This kind this kind of idea, uh, and it also. Um, brought up some sort of misunderstandings within Buddhism, where even among Buddhists, you will find that uh, the idea of the bodhisattva is supposed to be somebody who's avoiding the extreme of of uh, of nirvana. That that nirvana is an extreme, and the bodhisattva is somebody who's 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 doing their dawnness. They're, 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 they're doing the hardest work that they can to avoid falling into the extreme of nirvana without an understanding of what it means to achieve nirvana in the first place. So because of that, uh, you have such silly things like, oh, this being is so pure, this being is too pure, it's an extreme purity. So this being has to do some dirty things so that this being cannot fall into the extreme of nirvana so that they can stay here in the middle path of samsara, okay? Samsara is not, is not, a, is not a middle path, okay? Uh, and so, so all this, without understanding uh, what it means to be in the middle, can make us uh, have a misunderstanding of, of, of the middle path. Mm -hmm. Where, to the point where, this is a bit uh, philosophical, okay? To the point where different schools of Buddhism that have uh, different schools which have uh, uh, created a strong demarcation as, okay, this is who we are, this is who you are. We, we are not the same. And, and why is it that they've reached this separation from each other is because this one is saying, what I am doing is the middle path. What you're doing is an extreme. And the other one is saying, no, what you're doing is an extreme. We are the ones following the middle path. Okay. So that's why you have uh, one, within one of the schools, they call themselves uh, um, uh, um, the, the followers of Madhyamika, followers of the middle way. Okay. So this is basically a response to those around them saying, hey, you've you lost the middle way. You're now on an extreme. We are now following the middle way and this is it. And they call themselves the middle way followers. Okay. It's because of, so everyone, everyone uh, in every school in one way or another, they, what they are doing is in their understanding of following the middle path. Okay. And in trying to 
follow the middle path, they have to give uh, they have to give us practical advice how to deal with our extreme emotions. Okay, so one middle path is stay away from extreme emotions at all costs. That is very nice advice. If it was that easy to just say, oh, that's an extreme emotion, I'm gonna stay away from it. <laughs> when you're listening to the news and then somebody is saying something that, and then you find your anger uh, boiling, boiling over. You don't say, oh, that's, uh, that news is not helping me. I'm gonna stay away from that, okay? Or someone say something to you, someone at work or someone in the street, someone uh, does something to you, or you see something, you you encounter something where the natural is, response is a very strong emotion. So with the advice, very good advice, if you could, if you could with your own will say, oh, that's an extreme emotion, okay, stop. And then somehow you find yourself not having experience in that strong emotion, then you'll be, uh, we, we, there won't be any need for any other people to give any other explanation. It's because that doesn't work for everybody. So someone else has to come up with another explanation. Okay. The thing is, what is what will work for you? You can take what one group calls, that's an extreme, which is stay away from everybody, stay away from anyone that will excite you. Stay away from them. Uh, live a solitary life where no one, where there will be no danger of someone making you angry, someone create, uh, uh, giving rise to great uh, passion within you, so you, so you can stay in the middle. Okay. If that is something that you are absolutely capable of doing, then take that approach. But the thing is, the approach isn't simply. Uh, Remember, it's not simply stay away from getting sick, but rather strengthen yourself so that if you do encounter the possibility of getting sick, your immune system will protect you. Think of it, your, your psychic immune system will protect you. Your psychological immune, psychological immune system will protect you. Okay. Because you could stay in the cave for a very long time isolated from others, but you're not really doing anything to actually strengthen yourself. So the aim of freedom is still very far from you because you have to stay away. You don't have the freedom to roam wherever you want to. So you're in, in a sense, you're, you're a prisoner to isolation. Okay. But if that, if that what you need to do in the beginning, then you have to do that in the beginning. But for most of us, uh, I would say uh, for most of us in the modern time, that's almost impossible to do. It's, it's almost impossible to, uh, to even go in a forest and be alone. That's even, almost, almost, even that is, has be, is becoming more and more impossible. Okay. So what should you do when you uh, have the stimulation and you can't stay away? Like one, one way of staying away is uh, don't listen to the news anymore if the news is if, if listening to the news brings you into a unhealthy extreme where you find yourself lost in anger or lost in whatever extreme, which is not healthy for you, okay? So stay away from, from news. But does that mean that you should have no, you should, you should not know what's going on in the world? What if there's a very important announcement that's only been given in the news? How are you gonna know? Okay, so there's that. But if that is the method for you, that will work for you. If you're in such an extreme case that uh, listening to the news or uh, being in close proximity with what is stimulating a strong, uh, un unhealthy, extreme emotion, staying away from it, do it. But know that it's, this is only a temporary uh, measure. This is not the ultimate measure. Okay. Now, within uh, some other schools, uh, they 
they consider, and, and by other school doesn't necessarily mean that this is the right one or this is the wrong one, okay? It, this is what, what will work for you. Uh, I have to give a little bit of, of a background. The background is mindfulness. Mindfulness meaning being aware of your state of mind, being aware of what certain emotions do to you, allowing yourself to be aware of them, wh wh whatever, whether they are extreme or whether they are um, uh, boring, whatever is actually happening to you, allow yourself to be aware of it so that you yourself can come up with a catalog of this is healthy, this is unhealthy for me, okay? Uh, I would even venture to say there are some people who are extremely quiet and that, that, and that could be uh, an extreme where for their own health, they may need to be loud. And there are those who are too familiar with being loud and they need to be quiet. So that, see, we're going toward a different way of a middle, middle path here. Okay. Uh, it's, it's being able to respond to the world, being able to respond to your environment in a way that is healthy for both you and the other. That's the middle. It's, or, or you can say healthy, healthy interaction. And because this is uh, very uh, relational, what could be the middle here may be the, an extreme there, and what could be an extreme there could be the middle here. And I'm gonna say uh, the example again of if you're someone who is an extreme in the quiet, the, and you may encounter a situation where you need to stop being quiet. You need to be, you need to voice, you need to be, be loud, but not loud in a way where you are being overwhelmed, but, but skillfully being loud. And if you're someone who's constantly loud, you, the middle way for you or the response for you may be one day to deliberately, consciously, skillfully be quiet. Okay. And how do you know which one to do? Because it's not some universal thing, you just have to allow the situation to guide you. You have to make direct contact with your own intuition to guide you as to what to do at that moment. That is the healthiest way to be, okay? Now, the other side of using, making use of these strong emotions, especially strong emotions of anger, when we are, when we were, uh, sort of trained to view emotions of anger, jealousy as poisons. And the general advice has been stay away from them, stay away from what stimulates them. And that's all good, but unfortunately we cannot always avoid being, uh, uh, making contact with those kinds of emotions. And it is, I have to say, it is as merely as a skill for those of us who are honestly completely, uh, who are completely under the control of these kinds of extreme emotions. That's how we relate with them. We relate with them in a way that is unhealthy. We relate with them in a way that is uh, harmful to ourselves because that is the habit that we have developed with these kinds of emotions. Sorry about the siren, if you're hearing it. Uh, because, you know, uh, in a general, generally speaking way, our way of relating with these emotion is unhealthy unbalanced, harmful to ourselves. So the general skillful advice that is given is stay away from them. And we are even tr given advice to train ourselves to regard them as poisons, okay? But it doesn't, they're not saying that they are absolutely in their own, in their own 
uh, nature poisonous, but rather because of the way that we have been trained, the way that we have habituated ourselves with these kinds of emotions, that we have made them poisonous to us. And we have to convince ourselves that they are poison. And we, be, and we do that, uh, deliberately make ourselves see them as poisons. But eventually, we, as we mature, we have to stop because we have to deliberately create this kind of, of uh, relationship with them just as a way to free ourselves from the overwhelming power they have over us. That the harm that they continue to give us because of the, of, of the, of the uh, unhealthy relationship that we have established with them. Okay. And eventually, uh, as we become more, as we get more mature on the path, we have to reintroduce ourselves to these very same emotions and no longer see them as poisons, but see them as pure as just energy. And that is why um, uh, they use uh, philosophical terms to describe them as, as no longer being inherently poisonous. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the philosophical term that they use, but I'll simply say this, every emotion you have, every emotional reaction you have is speaking a truth. It is not speaking necessarily an absolute truth, okay? I'm not talking about absolute truth here. I'm talking about a truth, uh, a, 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 a level of conviction. You could, I, I will even say, it's speaking a level of conviction. So because of that, consider every emotion to be a messenger whether it's anger, whether it's jealousy, whether it is uh, attachment, whatever the emotional response that you find yourself naturally, that's naturally coming up, consider it to be a messenger. It is telling you, it is pointing to a conviction that, you, that we have. And consider the messenger's arrival not it's, it, 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 it hasn't arrived with the intention to, dis, to do you harm. Anger that does not come up with the intention of harming you. Anger comes up because of a conviction that we have established that we are in danger and we need to protect ourselves. So anger is actually coming up as a, we, uh, another, uh, an, another side of compassion. It's a kind of a self-concern for your safety. And it's almost, almost as if something is about to harm you, you need destructive energy. Here is the destructive energy to protect yourself. Now, the truth that is being, uh, being related to you is that I have established some way in my continuum that the signs that I'm now picking up are signs that I need to be protected. That's, the, that's what I'm referring to as the truth. The thing is, somewhere deep within me, I'm convinced I need protection from this. And that's why the anger comes up. If I did not establish this as a truth, then the need to protect myself would not come up. Okay. So whenever anger comes up, immediately know that a part there is a there's a some sort of compassionate concern within you, giving you. Uh, the energy, the power to destroy something that you have established as something that is harmful to you. So when you take that perspective and you want to deal with this in a 
most skillful way possible. What you want to do is you want to take that energy and direct it in such a way that it actually gives you the sense of being protected. But unfortunately, uh, the disease, the miss, uh, not the miss, the, the, the unhealthy way of having re to, of relating with this energy in the past has been, we just take it and we just blindly just throw it out and hoping that it destroys the target. It's like, uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you have a cluster of destructive, uh, uh, op <laughs> a cluster of bombs, and then th there's a, a danger coming at you. And without even looking at where is it coming from, so you can get it, just throw it and hoping that it will, one, it, one, of, the, one of the targets will be that thing that is, was, threatening, was, was threatening you. But when you do that, you may also destroy things that may have been there to help you. Okay. And they may not necessarily be out there. There could be things within here that could have been under ready to help you, but because we indiscriminately, blindly just, just throw the energy that was given to us to, for, for our protection, we end up harming our own selves also. Okay. And there are many sort of skillful ways of using these kinds of destructive extreme emotions. Uh, you can use visualization where you visualize the energy uh, in some form going out into the world and doing and and pre and uh, what's that? Uh, uh, surgically doing the destruction so that only what needs to be destroyed gets to be destroyed. Okay, that is if it is absolutely necessary that something needs to be destroyed. Now, the reason that I say there's a, it's revealing a truth is because this is what we have to uh, investigate. Is it perhaps when we first signed that contract, we were, I don't know, very young, very powerless. And at that situation, we needed the, uh, the energy to help us. But we are no longer in that situation and we may no longer be as powerless as we were back then. So we mean the situation that is presenting itself may look like the situation we were in the past, but it's not necessarily exactly same same situation where we are we are now powerless and we need extra energy to get ourselves out, or perhaps this is no longer a danger to us. It's no longer a threat to us. So that's what we have to allow ourselves to clearly see. Remember, you told me this is the anger. Remember, you told me when this situation comes up, you need destructive energy. Here it is. And what's happening is that's when you're feeling angry, you're feeling the need to do something destructive. And without, uh, in this very uh, naive spiritual way of saying, oh, anger is no good, stay away from me, anger, you're destroying my spirituality, you know, the, uh, consider the anger to be coming towards you because it wants to help you. So relate with the anger that way. Don't relate with the anger with somehow some demon is, is uh, some outside force is trying, is coming to destroy, to, uh, to harm you. But rather approach that is, let yourself, feel the, let yourself feel the anger and ask the anger exactly what is the, what is the harm that is trying to protect you from? And are you still in need of protection from, from, from it? If you are no longer in need of protection from it, for most of us, we are no longer, uh, these are things that happen at a certain time and we sign the contract then, but we are no longer in the same situation anymore. We may no longer need that, okay? And when we find that we no longer need that, we have to tell the anger, thank you very much. Thank you for your compassionate concern for me that 
without me necessarily consciously calling you, you just came, you just arrived ready to help me because you saw that I needed protection and you are, you, and, and it's ready for me to, uh, um, I'm being given the destructive power that I, that I need to deal with what, what, what is threatening me. So thank you for, for showing up. And how many, uh, how many things in our lives are, uh, are able to show up like that? Not that many. There are a lot of things that we are hoping to show up, don't show up. But here it is. You're in danger. Before you even call for me, here I am. So tell your anger thank you for showing up, for, for looking out for you, for wanting to protect you. And you just have to, you just have to uh, allow the, the part of you that is able to discern, is this a situation that I need protection from? Okay. And then if it is a situation where you need protection from, and ask, ask uh, that same uh, capacity of discernment within you, okay, how do I make use of this anger now? How do I skillfully make use of this anger? Like if you're encountering injustice, for example, not necessarily injustice that is being done to you, it could be just your own compassionate concern, you're seeing injustice being done somewhere, and then anger is coming up within you. So something within you is asking, is say, you, something needs to be destroyed. Be careful and be wise how you use this destructive power. Don't just throw the bomb and hoping that it, it blows away that, need, what, that which is to be destroyed. Don't misuse this energy that, is, that you're being given. Make sure it, 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 it is directed towards exactly what needs to be directed towards so that that thing, whatever it is, can be, can be destroyed so that justice can prevail, okay? And there are many ways that you can do this. Uh, uh, like uh, towards injustice, for example, the anger that comes up towards injustice. What is, what is the way that I can use this energy that I'm being given so that this injustice can be dealt with? Where I'm not just uh, completely being overwhelmed by my by misunder uh, uh, misunderstanding, okay, but rather consciously, deliberately honoring the anger, and then directing its destructive power towards that which is required to be destroyed, or that which is required to be transformed. And since transforming is uh, no. Uh, this is not just something you just do willy-nilly, okay? Because if you're transforming something, you're giving it a different shape, the different shape, the different form that you're gonna give it to, give it, is it something that is gonna be beneficial or is it gonna just do more damage? Okay. And this way of relating towards, uh, with our uh, em extreme emo uh, emo emotions, is to, it's, it's not just only with anger where you have this way. And the way to sort of come to know what am I supposed to do with this emotion that's coming up? Let's say, for example, uh, extreme jealousy. Before you even go into this uh, immature, semi spiritual way of saying, oh, jealousy is bad to get out of my head, but rather approach it with, okay, what concern jealousy do you have for me that, you are, that, you, that you've come up? What is it that you're trying to take care of? Um, perhaps I don't feel 
my sense of value is being appreciated, or perhaps I feel what I value, I'm going to lose. So all these things are worthy of, of addressing. So the jealousy, in, in a way, uh, consider it to be in the same way like anger is has a message for you. There's a truth that we have established that it is reminding us. And we have to re-examine this truth that we have established, whether it is still truth. Is it still a truth? Okay. And without having to go to go into each emotion and give a, a, uh, an example of, okay, this is how you, you deal with this, but this general approach will sort of allow your intuition to guide you so that you stay in a way that is healthy, you honor the emotion without necessarily uh, falling into the, uh, the, un, um, the unhealthy habit of mis, mis, um, mis, was that misrepresenting or mistreating or mis or uh, relating with these emotions in a way that uh, that 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 uh, that continues the experience of being harmed and harming others. Okay. Uh, and I'll put this, and uh, th this is coming from the perspective. This kind of teaching is coming from the perspective of the Dharma Datu kind of teaching. Dharma Datu meaning um, the foundation of ex of reality is uh, is this blissful luminous blissful luminous presence, and and everything that comes out of it is uh, in a way. Um, an emergent of, of that, of that property. So even things like that appear to be completely contrary to it are uh, in, a, in a sense, just different uh, arrangement. Think of it as not that it is energy, but we will it will be easier to understand, but let's say it is some sort of fundamental energy that everything is sort of coming out of, okay? Everything is a restructuring of that kind of energy. And however it appears, it is still that energy that is being sort of uh, uh, manipulated in a way uh, to appear a certain way. So anger is coming out of that. So if you consider a a a anger and all these emotions are essentially coming out of this field of which is essentially bliss, luminous presence, then to consider anger uh, in nature to be an enemy of that is, is in, a, in a sense making the very, very making the very fundamental, the, the, making the very foundation of reality itself into an enemy of itself. But if you have that approach, not that the way that we've handled these emotions, we just continue to handle them that way, but to have a different approach, not seeing them as enemies from the very beginning, but rather have a different approach and uh, where we give we, that they have, I'm not, I'm not speaking in a, You know, that they have a purpose. And I'm not talking about purpose in a uh, in a way that is uh, what you call that uh, fatalistic, right? But but purpose in a sense of there's a and I'll, I'll even say it this way, there's an evolutionary reason that is by evolutionary reason i mean the, something comes out because the intention was to protect and preserve 
right? So if you consider these emotions to be uh, necessary uh, uh, evolutionary, pro that comes out of the uh, necessary evolutionary process, then in that sense, they have a purpose, a purpose of protecting us. Really, cons and really consider these emotions to have a purpose other than just dis harming us, harming others. Really consider them to be, they are there to really protect you. They're there to really to take care of you. And allow them to do that instead. Allow anger to protect you. Allow jealousy to protect you. Okay. That when you're in the midst of feeling them, rather than going to the extreme of unhealthy relationship, relationship with them, but, but let them sort of guide you as to what new truth I need to acquire today. What truth do I need to strengthen today? And always uh, have gratitude towards them because they they will they will always be there for you. Okay. Um, and one last thing I wanted to say in terms of extreme and the misunderstanding of that. Uh, Our natural state, as I mentioned, is for the sake of for the sake of communicating, for the for the sake of of giving explanation, giving words to it, or for the sake of having being able to have some sort of conceptualization of what that would be, the term bliss is used. But it is not a bliss of an extreme, it is not uh, just the end of the spectrum of what we experience as pleasant, but rather it is uh, when we remove every disturbance, when we remove every misunderstanding, compared to the state where we are disturbed, compared to that, that's bliss. But it's not a bliss in the sense of do this nice good deed and we will reward you with a, with, you will be rewarded with a, with, 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 a, with a little bit of bliss or with some bliss. Don't think of it as a reward. Because if we think of it as a reward naturally, we will relate to it in a way that we relate with, 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 with these emotions and we make them extremes. But rather understand them to be just because we don't have the, the direct vocabulary, the direct conceptual, we, we cannot have a, a, a direct conceptual way of understanding this. So the closest thing that is that coming from our experiences that can sort of give us a hint as to what that is, we use the word bliss, okay? So it's not that the end, the, the, the end of the path, which is called us of the middle path, is to reach an extreme of bliss. And one last thing, and this is really the one last thing, and so, this is something that I'm remembering from Nizam's uh, 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 email, where w there is the danger of thinking that the middle is boring. Uh, so if we understand this, fundamental bliss 
is present in every moment. It's not that this fundamental, uh, fundamental nature has highs and has lows. It's always just like this. So middle, you could say the middle path is aligning ourselves with the fundamental nature where we naturally experience where our consciousness is, is, is so clear that the very clarity of consciousness is when compared to something out uh, that is not experiencing it as bliss, we experience, we, we, we would say it's blissful. But just for the sake of talking about it, we have to say that. But in its own realm of experience, it, it is beyond those terms. So the middle path is actually aligning ourselves with natural bliss. And I'll end at this. And I almost did it <laughs> with the timing. <laughs> uh, any questions or comments? Well, there was one. Sorry, my internet's not so great. I hope you can hear me. I hear you. Okay. There was one question in the chat. I wonder if uh, Kirat Kirat wants to ask it or I can ask it for them. Or maybe it was answered already. I can ask. I'm just walking so I don't mind the, the background noise. Um, I'm curious though. I really appreciated your reflection on utilizing the energy of the sensation instead of minimizing it because I feel like it's really challenging when working with powerful emotions like grief or rage or sorrow, you know, emotions that have um, just a lot more weight than maybe some others. And I'm wondering what your perspective is on when you're feeling those emotions, maybe you're stuck in a psychological state like that. What do you do when even the choice to relate differently doesn't feel possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whenever, uh, I mean, whenever any emotion, especially an emotion that is shouting, is being experienced, uh, no matter how difficult it is, we have to relate with it. And the way you can relate with it is to just consider it to be another, almost, um, you can relate with it as if it's another person, a dear friend visiting you without uh, wishing within you, I don't want to feel this, I don't want to feel this, I don't want to feel this, don't, don't do that. But rather relate with it, have a conversation with it. In, I mean, deliberately, I mean, literally in, inside you, have a conversation with it. Welcome, what are you trying to protect me from? What are you trying to give me? When, uh, what are the signs that made you feel the need to come to come up? Okay, have have in on your own way have a conversation with it. That's in a way what you're uh, practically doing at that moment by having this conversation with it. You are no longer caught up in in what you might call the being stuck. You're redirecting yourself without. Uh, you're redirecting without. Uh, uh, without neglecting, no. It's, I mean, it sounds like I should say that because it they were kind of rhyme, but I'm not trying to make it rhyme. <laughs> you're, uh, yeah, you, you, you're doing that without, you know, without uh, denying it. Okay, you're acknowledging its presence, but you're acknowledging its presence in such a way where you're able to be aware of what it feels like, what it is, but having, but at the same time, not being overwhelmed by it. Okay. The first thing, first reaction I would say is don't try not to feel it. Don't wish that you were not feeling it. Okay. But rather have a, have, engage it in dialogue. 
And even if it doesn't speak, if it's pouting, like it's saying, you should know already. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you. <laughs> okay. Keep keep having a dialogue with it. Okay. And that is practically uh and skillfully distracting yourself. And, and by distracting, I'm not I'm not saying uh denying it, but rather taking yourself away from the experience of being overwhelmed. I hope that helps. You got a heart, or you can see it. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I was just going to say, Prince, it sounds like it's the difference between engaging with the emotion or the emotional part rather than trying to manage it, which feels yeah. very different. Yeah. 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 And can you imagine, uh, I mean, in a way, the emotion <laughs> looking at you, <laughs> you're trying to manage me? Am I here because you called me? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I want to come at Yes, please. Um, I'm just struck in in this talk that in a, in a way that I never really thought about before. But the qualifying and naming it the middle way seems very misleading, in the sense that it it puts it between the it, the extremes. When what we're talking about is something like a whole different reality. Um, I mean, maybe it's because you're saying it's non conceptual. You can't really. I like the way you say the middle way is aligning with maybe the truth of the bliss of reality, but you can't even define that. So when we say the middle, we think, oh, that's between extremes, but really it has nothing to do with the extremes. It's like a whole nother way of relating. Does that make sense? Or it's hitting me in a new way, I think. It's sort of, mm -hmm. what I'm hearing is like the non, the middle way is non-dual, but when we say middle, it conjures dualism. Oh yes, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, there's the there's the this the left and the right extreme, right, and then basically the middle way seems to be saying what you're saying is uh, affirming the duality, but this middle way is basically no middle way. almost sounds like uh yeah advice from nagarjuna the father of middle way when he's saying when do you how do you know when you finally understand the middle way when there's no more middle way <laughs> yeah uh, very nice you got you caught on to that thank you but the 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 uh, what what you might call the the immediate application of this, you have to be honest with where you are. If in order for you to get to that sort of like ideal middle way, you need the duality of okay, that's this, that's there. Let me stay in the middle. Then you have to do that. Then eventually, by being sincere with that, you will arrive at the middle way that Nagarjuna in the end says, that's the real middle way, when there is no more middle way. Yes. So, Mike, I guess my trying to comprehend and get it all clear for myself. So instead of going to one extreme or another, total bliss or, or total non-bliss, Mm -hmm. is that acknowledging those emotions having that conversation with those emotions and by doing that you fall into this middle because now you've acknowledged it so it's not pulling you to the right or to the left you've acknowledged it you acknowledge why it's happening and so then it gives you the bliss or the nirvana to be in the middle to the point that as you continue this practice 
then it will never you it, the, the middle does disappear because you'll just be you'll just be interacting with people as they are and and it doesn't move you in any kind of way it's just flowing through life so my, wow nice oh okay Very nice. Uh, I'm not sure if you're asking a question, but uh, this, this summary is beautiful. Well, I'm just trying to understand, you know, as you're mm -hmm. speaking, and this is what I'm processing, so that I, so that I'm clear. Yeah, yeah, that's. I would say, that's very clear. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and the danger that I'm, that I, uh, I, I I'm glad that we are arriving this naturally, organically, rather than me throwing this at you or the middle is no middle is that from the very beginning then you, you don't fall into the danger of you know uh uh not really honoring reality living in a fantasy oh there's no middle you know somebody's somebody's harming you oh there's no middle <laughs> you're harming someone oh there's no middle you know that's that that's that's that, that'll be an extreme <laughs> making the middle into an extreme Okay. Isn't that nice? When you really abide in the middle, the middle disappears. And uh, and like you said, then you're meeting people where they are. And because you remain in the middle, if they're if they're in this place, you're able to meet them in that place, but you're in the middle, <laughs> if you understand what I mean. They may be there in the extreme, but you're able to see them and meet them there, but you're in, remain in the middle. Remember, all those things are coming from this. If you stay here all the time, then you are basically everywhere. Oh my God, I'm doing this. <laughs> that was the teaching. Oh, after all that talk, that's all you need to do. <laughs> uh, well, I'm wow, you people are very, very uh very up up there. Thank you. All right. I guess uh we all stunned. It's time to uh end. <laughs> Abiding in the blissful middle. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, do a closing meditation. Communicate to your system that you're going to meditate. Allow the natural intelligence to come and guide you. And once you feel you are touching, you're tasting the meditative state in the body, in the breath, and the mind. Make a commitment to it with a nice deep breath. Let yourself go, let yourself go into it, let yourself go into it. Feel yourself letting go into it, going deeper in the body, deeper in the breath, deeper in the mind. Notice the signs, rejoice. Look at this beautiful unit called me. And how directly perceived it is comprised of different parts, left, right, top, bottom. 
and yet they're all me. This mystery called me. Be aware of how any part being a member of this me instinctively is ready to render aid or assistance to any other parts, not thinking I will help that part, but rather I will help me. And let the sense of me expand, feel all, see and feel all of us sitting in a circle in your place, no matter how small or big it is, we all fit comfortably. And we are us. And as we begin to really sense that sense of us-ness, a bright presence appears in the center to help us focus on that sense of us-ness. And as the instinct, the readiness to help one another becomes the same as the right helping the left and feeling I'm helping myself. As it gets stronger and stronger, that bright presence in the center begins to expand and becoming brighter and brighter until all appearances of me, you disappears into just this big usness. And it continues to expand, including your neighbors, your neighborhood, all life, the trees, the mountains, the waters, the skies, And this sense of usness is felt, you towards the ocean, you towards rivers, you towards the trees and grass and mountains. The same instinct, ready to help, you feel it, ready to help the trees, ready to help the, your neighbors. And it is so instinctive. We no longer need a symbol to remind you. That big ball of light begins to contract. And whatever it touched, it leaves a shimmer. Until it becomes that point of light in the center of our circle. Sending rays of light, touching each one of our hearts, connecting us. And we have this conclusion, this conviction. When I sincerely help us, I help me. When I sincerely help me, I help us. And with that conviction, no longer needing an outside validating symbol. The light dissolves into our hearts. And whatever gifts you may have received from tonight, think of something that is of sincere concern to you, whether it is completely personal or for someone you know or a place you know, dedicate this gift to help address that concern. Sunam Yeshit of Zoshin. 
是那也是的中文，但把古尼都不熟。And notice the signs that you are indeed in the meditative state. Noticing the signs, rejoice. Make the intention to come out of the meditation. And with that, you can take a nice deep breath. And as you breathe out, let yourself reconnect with your immediate surroundings, reconnect with your sense of touch, reconnect with your sense of hearing. Reconnect with your sense of sight, deliberately noticing lights, shadows, colors, shapes. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. And as usual, we end up way later than we supposed to. <laughs> it was your fault. You were asking. You were saying those beautiful things at the end. <laughs> Okay. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Hi. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>